Good evening, class. Nice to see you again. Um, this is Steve Cole, and this is going to be part one of the PARM 223 Unit 10 lecture series. Uh, one of the really nice things about COVID is that I'm actually recording this in my PJs, in my basement, hanging out at ODARK30. And I'll even comment about whatever refreshments I may or may not be imbibing. So I hope that as I am enjoying this. Uh, you will take advantage of the COVID uh, crisis and make the most of it yourself. So let's move on. So I am going to discuss today. Um, this. Let me back up. This this unit's uh, theme is neurological emergencies, and so is next unit, as a matter of fact. And this unit's uh, the two topics we're going to talk about. One of them is autonomic dysreflexia. And I was actually really pleasantly surprised when I found out that Rod hit this pretty heavily in uh, the class last year when I gave this lecture before I gave it. Um, and as you may or may not be aware, if he did the same this year, Rod, Rod's um, family member has autonomic dysreflexia, so it's something that strikes him very close to home. For me, um, like the whole theme of this class, these are things that... I wish they had taught me about in paramedic school, but they just really didn't, or they covered very minimally. And this is one of those things that they didn't touch upon at all in my paramedic course. And then when I started doing uh, critical care and um, high acuity inner facility uh, transports with uh, and long flights, I was doing fixed wing uh, critical care transports for the VA. And a lot of those veterans were quadriplegics or uh, paraplegics and so on and so forth. So autonomic dysreflexia, especially over a long flight with the pressure changes and atmospheric changes and everything that goes into flight physiology, all of that became pertinent. And I really felt that I wish I had known more about it. And of course, uh, I went out and found what I could. This was in the early days of the internet, fortunately. You have much more resources to do so. But still, if you if, you know, you will encounter patients with autonomic dysreflexia in a wide variety of circumstances. Uh, there are three or four patients that we've encountered over the years here in uh, our local jurisdiction that became kind of pseudo-regulars who were very, um, we weren't necessarily seeing them always for their AD, but it, a, their AD was always a concern while we're packaging them and transporting them and caring for them. So, even if, the, even if you're seeing a patient for something completely different, you still need to be aware of this condition if they're quadriplegic. Or tetraplegic is another term for it now. So, let's get on to it. Your objectives for this are going to be, of course, define what autonomic dysreflexia is. We're going to talk about the pathophysiology, characteristics. We're going to talk about some of the challenges, some uh, mimics. And uh, in the second part, we're going to focus on the pre hospital considerations, how it applies to you and the care that you do. So what is autonomic dysreflexia? Um, well, it is legitimately a potentially life-threatening condition that affects spinal cord injured patients. Um, this is something I've had actually a number of legit spinal cord injured patients in my, in my uh, career as a paramedic. Uh, and of course, we're worried about trying to prevent further injury and everything in the initial phase, but we don't think much about all the different sequelae afterward. You know, at most we might think, okay, yeah, they've got a long road of rehab and so on and so forth. But there's a lot more that happens to the body after the spinal cord gets severed. So this is a condition that typically onsets days to weeks post injury. And it's something that they will then deal with for the remainder of their life. Uh, about 80% of patients that have a uh, um, cord injury above T6, a complete cord injury above T6 will suffer this condition. Now, wh what are the life-threatening concerns? Well, in essence, this is a hypertensive emergency, although it is distinctly different from the other hypertensive emergencies you may encounter, such as true hypertensive crisis or uh, anything of that nature. But it can, like many other hypertensive emergencies, cause stroke can cause acute flash pulmonary edema, can cause encephalopathic, encephalopathic symptoms, uh, can cause seizures, coma, and of course death if left untreated. And the really interesting thing for me when I was reading this is most of the initial treatments are very firmly in the realm of EMT basic land. 
Uh, yes, there are some pharmacological um, things to consider with this, but um, overall, most of these, uh, especially on the prevention side, is in the realm of the EMT basic kit. And, uh, and honestly, in many uh, private agencies, uh, a non-emergent um, patient going to the doctor's office or something like that that has a cord injury would be a BLS call. They would stick two EMTs, probably the two greenest EMTs around, and have them run this, and they would be completely oblivious to the uh, concerns that are involved in this, and maybe even exacerbate it. So that's something that kind of struck me as well. So brief history. Well, we know that it's been around as long as people have been uh, suffering cord injuries, and there's actually an ancient papyrus almost 5,000 years old that describes this condition, post cord injury, and describes it as an ailment not to be treated. In other words, it was considered just unfortunate and that was all that could be done to make the patient comfortable until they passed. It was described again in the modern, if you want to call that medical literature in 1890, and then uh, first described the term in 1917. And then as things progressed over and over again, you see some of the uh, studies up there. Now, here we are in 2020, but still one of the most comprehensive uh, guidelines uh, started with the Paralyzed Veterans America Association, uh, where they have this uh, rather so decent comprehensive document published in 2001 called Acute Management of Autonomic Dysreflexia, and I still refer to that. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So... Autonomic reflexes is even made into the big screen. Uh, the uh, Lincoln Rhymes, the um, protagonist, one of the two protagonists of the movie The Bone Collector, with a somewhat young uh, Angelina Jolie, he suffered autonomic dysreflexia. He didn't do a very good job of it, though, honestly. Uh, there is actually a new series out called uh, Lincoln Rhymes, The Search of the Bone Collector. It's on Hulu. I'm just starting to watch it just because I, I like serial killer films. And I'll let you know if they do a good job with that. Uh, but so far, it's they do a better job than they did in the movie. So who can get AD? Well, it's obviously spinal cord in, uh, injured patients. And just so you know, there's roughly a million and a half spinal cord injured patients of all types in the U.S. alone. So spinal cord injury is not uncommon. I mean, yes, we have 350 million people, so that's less than 1%. But... Uh, when you look at the slice of our pie of the patients we see, we it, it's not an uncommon thing to encounter uh, a patient for one reason or another that also has spinal cord injuries. Now, spinal cord injury specifically refers to quadriplegics, also known as tetraplegics, and high-level paraplegics. By high-level paraplegics, we mean above T6, and we'll describe why that is so important. So, as a clue, you might have to recall that AD is usually occur, occurs in patients with a core transection or injury above T6. You will see that again. Rarely between T10 and T6, uh, but uh, usually above T6. 91% with a complete injury versus 27% with an incomplete injury. So where are we getting the 20 set, or where are we getting complete versus incomplete? Uh, sometimes the terms are used. Uh, interchangeably because somebody can have an incomplete injury below a certain level and complete above um, or you know vice versa so for example uh, many many years ago when I was a brand new paramedic uh, I went on an auto accident in Tennessee and there was this 14 year old girl who uh, was out joyriding with people she shouldn't have and got in a car wreck in this old 72 78 Buick or something like that and uh, she was uh, you know just catastrophically had a cervical spinal injury uh, and that was her only injury which was remarkable uh, given that what had happened to the car but later you know both you know and this was back in the days when we did high, high dose cyamedrol which isn't a thing anymore thank god and some other things but we took all the care we could we flew her to Vanderbilt so on and so forth and she was and what they called an incomplete uh, quad at like C... I want to say C5 and C6, and by incomplete, what they meant, she had some function at that level, but certainly um, below that level, um, she was completely paralyzed. So, 
Uh, so she ended up, if I recall correctly, with some shoulder movement and maybe uh, a little bit of coarse movement of her extremities uh, with, compared to some people that have zip at the, at the line of injury. So there you go. Obviously, more males and females have spinal cord injury, but that's not unsurprising when you consider spinal cord injuries are usually traumatic in nature. And men, uh, quite honestly, we're boneheads and we're doing boneheaded stuff and usually alcohol is involved so we have a higher risky a higher uh, elevation level of risk and therefore we have an elevated level of spinal cord injury and those stats are from the reeves foundation if you don't remember who christopher reeves was christopher reeves uh pretty much is the arch typical superman uh who suffered a severe catastrophic cord injury and dedicated his life uh, along with his wife to uh, advancing, um, advocating for those with injury, and advancing research. So AD is a hypertensive emergency, as we talked about. And the short version is AD causes an abnormal sympathetic response. So if you think about fight or flight and everything, a sympathetic response. And the cord injury, normally what would happen is we'd have a parasympathetic response to balance out. The cord injury prevents that. So the sympathetic system runs rampant. That's it in a nutshell. Obviously it's more complex, but that's it in a nutshell. Now the good news, as I mentioned, is simple things can prevent it. Most of those things are BLS, but untreated or exacerbated or ignored or unmitigated AD can become fatal or even further disability, debilitating. Let's talk about this. We know what the spinal cord is. Um, hopefully we know what our nervous systems are. We're going to talk about the 10th cranial nerve. Although cranial nerve X. God, that sounds... That sounds like that could be a punk rock band, really. Cranial nerve X. Carotid baroceptors, which you may or may not be aware of, and the splenic vascular bed. So let's take a five-second review of our nervous system here. Here we have our nervous system. Of course, we have the peripheral and the central nervous system. And if we take the central nervous system out, we're left with the peripheral nervous system, which is where most of our autonomic uh, nervous system resides. Of course, with the central nervous system, we're talking about the brain. And yeah, the brain and the spinal cord, but follow me here. When we talk about the peripheral nervous system, we have the voluntary, the involuntary, the autonomic, or the somatic. And again, we're going to take out the voluntary or the somatic nervous system, which leaves us with the autonomic left. And of course, the divisions of the autonomic are the sympathetic and parasympathetic, the fight or flight or the feed or breed. And when we look at the part we're mainly concerned about, this is where autonomic dysreflexia lives. So in essence, somewhere in the extremities or in the body, I shouldn't say the extremities, but in the body, in, this, in the realm of the peripheral nervous system, which is everywhere that's not the spinal cord or the brain, we have a noxious stimuli. A noxious stimuli is an uncomfortable, painful, or otherwise uh, abnormal stimuli that s causes a sympathetic response. Now, this sympathetic response may not be a big deal normally, but even if it is, the parasympathetic nervous system typically acts in opposition and balances it out. So we normally have this complementary and synergistic balance going on uh, but in autonomic dysreflexia, this doesn't happen. Now, the reason this doesn't happen in AD is uh, the parasympathetic response that we're talking about is normally mediated through cranial nerve X. And as I talked about, the cranial nerve X is the vagus nerve. Now, the other part that we don't always think about is the parasympathetic nerve system is also mediated through S2, S3, and S4 spinal nerves. So we have two areas of the spinal, uh, or correction, of the parasympathetic nervous system that we have the parasympathetic response mediated through. And the problem is, is that when we have an injury about T6 or higher, then we have a division between these two mediation uh, areas of mediation. So we have the noxious stimuli that happens excuse me, happens somewhere in the body other than the spinal cord of the brain. Now this is picked up by the spinal cord and the spinal reflexes. So you have this painful response, say uh, an ingrown toenail. 
and you have this painful response that shoots up your ingrown toenail, through your foot, up your leg, up your thigh, up to the spinal cord, um, and then the spinal reflex, the spinal arc, it comes back before it even moves toward the brain. So this happens even though that impulse will never make it to the brain because of a spinal cord injury somewhere north of it. So because these spinal reflexes occur, they cause epinephrine to be excreted. Now this epinephrine would, would um, or can cause hypertension, tachycardia, and everything. Normally, this is mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. It's blunted and we might not ever um, experience much from it. But because of this spinal cord injury and this blocking of the parasympathetic response and to the point where only the spinal arc, the spinal reflexes are heard for lack of a better term, then that is why we have this abnormal, this dysreflexia, autonomic dysreflexia. And that's where the term comes from. So they become hypertensive. Now it doesn't stop here. Now there are chemical baroreceptors above the injury, usually in the carotid sinus that pick up increased pressure, uh, whether it be from increased, um, whatever the cause is, increased hypertension. Now the brain then sends a sympathetic response, or sorry, parasympathetic response down to balance out the hypertension, but because of the cord injury, it never occurs. So therefore the hypertension continues unopposed. Now the reason why we have bradycardia is because the vagus nerve still is intact and it runs to the brain, sorry, from the brain to the heart. So in addition, the, the bradycardia becomes pretty much the only way the brain can mitigate the hypertension. So you'll, you'll almost be like a Cushing's response. You'll have really high blood pressure, uh, really slow heart rate as a result of this. Now it's also worth noting that the bradycardia is not um, is not um, absolute. It occurs about 40% of the patients, but the encephalopathy, uh, encephalopathic symptoms do occur. Now you guys have probably already heard of these encephalopathic symptoms in a wide variety of situations. You just maybe have never connected them. So we talk about headache, photosensitive, nuchal pain and rigidity, visual disturbances, uh, with the exception of stuffy nose, all the other ones. These are the same symptoms you see with subarachnoid hemorrhage. These are also the same symptoms you can see with meningitis and even eclampsia. So the only the difference is, you know, you, you is the etiology of the hypertension and the pressure in the brain rather than um, the symptoms themselves. Now you often have flush sensation and diaphoresis above the injury and pale pallor, goosebumps, uh, and cold skin below the injury. Now here's one of the reasons why this hypertension is so, so big. So most of this hypertension is related to vascular tone, not to the heart rate's contribution, which is why the heart rate slowing down doesn't do much to lower the blood pressure. And most of this vascular tone isn't in the arms and legs, is actually in what we call this phalanic bed. Now this is the mesenteric um, vasculature around the intestines, uh, the pancreas, the spleen, the stomach, the liver. Uh, the, think of that as just the body's reservoir of blood. And I, I got out on the other side, but I want to say about 30 to 40% of our blood supply hangs out in there. Um, ready for a crisis to uh, where we need to increase our blood pressure. Now, what's really unique is for you and me, this is a great source of blood to get shunted to vital organs. In spinal cord injury, because they have a low resting catecholamine state as their baseline lower than what you and I have, these catecholamine receptors that are in the spinal bed become hyper-reactive to catecholamines when, when they do get stimulated. So again, this is another abnormal dysreflexic response. 
So it doesn't take very much on the catecholamine side, very much epinephrine, to cause severe vasoconstriction and severe hypertension. So what are we talking about hypertension? Well, very much like um, pregnant patients who have a lower baseline blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, so do spinal cord injury patients. So you may normally see them in the 80 or 90 systolic range, that's their normal. If you aren't sure, ask them. They should be able to tell you because they should be very aware of it. And then what happens is when they have this hypertensive, it usually is at least 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury or more above their baseline where it is. So what that means is a blood pressure of 120 over something might be at the lower end of autonomic dysreflexia for them. So you have to look at their symptoms. How are they feeling? What is symptomatic for them? But I've seen the cases where these blood pressures have been 180 and 200 and 210. And again, all these encephal encephalopathic symptoms, the headache, the photosensitivity, nuchal, nuchal pain, the rigidity of the neck, uh, visual disturbances, and stuffy nose, all those are classic. So the really bad stuff, of course, is seizure stroke. Uh, they can actually separate the retinas from uh, the hypertension. They can have flash pulmonary edema and MIs and all the bad stuff you'd normally expect. So what are the causes? And this is where um, we come into play, so to speak. So there's been plenty of studies on this and the two most common ones are rectal issues, and GI issues and GU issues. Bladder's distension. So many of these patients will have calves or the straight calf themselves. Um, and if that doesn't happen or they get UTI or anything related to their gastrointestinal system or gas, sorry, gastrourinary system can cause an exacerbation of AD. Matter of fact, about 80 to 90% of the cases start this way. Sometimes it's a painful response, rectal distension from being constipated or not getting their bowel care, pressure ulcers, urinary tract infections, and other various spasmatic musculoskeletal uh, conditions. So we talk about the GU causes and bladder distension. So a lot of times this can be from a kink catheter. I've had a patient who uh, trouble, you know, one of the first things they teach is check your catheter. Is it kinked? Is it blocked? Is it dislodged? Does it need flush? So on and so forth. And a p patient and his wife who went through all these and somehow missed that underneath his abdomen, the catheter just got kinked just a little bit and that causes AD. And the good news is that these are very easily corrected and when it's corrected, the AD subsides. Uh, the overfull catheter or bag, uh, drain the bag uh, is a big deal. If they need to be cath, facilitate that. If they get a UTI, which is very common with, especially with indwelling cath, I want to say that something like 80 to 90% of people with indwelling cath will get at least one UTI a year, if not more. Um, uh, just getting the UTI can precipitate this, and of course, kidney stones, anything that's painful. If you ever had a kidney stone, you know that's how painful that is. Now, GI pa or sorry, spinal cord patients develop a neurogenic bowel, a reflex bowel, to where they call it bowel training, where you can train them, their uh, lower GI tract, to help them um, have a bowel movement. And you know it's it's a process, and sometimes it requires digital um, digital disimpaction to start the process, and it's just part of their life. Uh, either them or the caregiver does for them. And if their caregiver does it too rough, or uh, they are too stimulatory with it, uh, if they don't do it enough and become constipated, they develop hemorrhoids, any number of different things. All of these can lead and increase. Um, can increase their um, their chance of uh, AD. So poop is important. So skin causes any type of pressure sores, anything of that nature. Believe it or not, wrinkles in the sheets. The sheets get balled up under them. The buckles. You, you know, if you and I were somebody tightened a buckle too tight or on a seat belt or it got underneath us, we would just move and fix it. They don't have the capability, so that noxious stimuli hurts a lot. Uh, their position, if their clothing gets bound up tight around them because we're inconsiderate or not paying attention, 
uh, pressure on an infect on an ingrown toenail or an infected wound, uh, anything of that nature can cause um, can cause AD. And you know, on this graphic, you can see all the different parts where people can um, develop pressure sores. Believe it or not, um, people with spinal cord injuries still have sometimes very active sex lives. Um, sometimes with assistance and with accommodations or, you know, some changes, but they still do. And sometimes the pressure uh, of the sexual activity can cause autonomic dysreflexia to happen. Um, so what's really important to keep in mind is sometimes they'll use Viagra to facilitate the erection. And uh, as we all know, Viagra can, and similar drugs can be a contraindication for nitroglycerin nitropaste. But nitroglycerin nitropaste is one of the options for care for the hypertensive crisis that doesn't respond to other treatment. So that's something you keep in mind. Sometimes even when people are doing everything right, you can still trigger an AD attack uh, with occupational therapy, physical therapy, stuff of that nature. Um, j just the uh, musculoskeletal movement sometimes can cause AD. Just like uh, people who have spinal cord injury can still have sex, they can still have babies and give birth with accommodation and so on and so forth. So even uh, pregnant patients who are not spinal cord injury have an increased chance of UTIs, and that can be a cause. Labor can be a cause of autonomic dysreflexia. Another thing, you know, uh, Braxton Hicks contractions, stuff of that nature. Uh, if you think about the pressure that the baby puts on the bladder, and we know that GU bladder issues are a cause of AD. So, you know, obviously this is a concern. Um, something else to keep in mind is that pregnant patients can also be preeclamptic with or without spinal cord injury. And if you think about the symptoms, sometimes it may be very difficult to tell the difference, which it is. So, with um, here's here, this chart is pretty much a to kind of help you um, tell the difference between eclampsia and autonomic dysreflexia. Some things we're looking at: the BP, uh, uh, bradycardia. The uh, with pregnant, pre, uh, sorry, preeclampsia, you will usually have tachycardia. With autonomic dysreflexia, you may have bradycardia. You may not. Not that we're going to be checking in the field, but with preeclampsia, you'll have positive protein in the urine. Um, the other thing is that with uh, preeclampsia, you will have uh, the flushed pallor and consistent skin throughout. You won't have a line of demarcation. And you usually shouldn't have edema with autonomic dysreflexia um, unless something else is going on. Let's talk about prevention and treatment. Well, as I say, an uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And the biggest one is take care of the bowel and bladder. Uh, making sure that the uh, Foley is properly positioned, it's not kinked, it's not clogged, it's well drained. If they have pressure sores, bed sores, make sure they're not laying on them. Provide extra padding, pillows, so, so on and so forth. They need a little bit. Um, make sure that their clothing doesn't get bound up around them. And uh, make sure you check their blood pressure frequently. Sometimes that they, uh, they frequently these patients will have an implanted baclofen pump. Baclofen is antispasmatic that can help mitigate AD, uh, and it's a little small interthecal catheter that goes into the uh, spinal cord space. But when and these pumps are usually um, refilled through injection, so uh, it's an outpatient process. But if they don't make it in, if they can actually go in baclofen withdrawal. And this can mimic or precipitate AD as well. So that pretty much brings us to the end of part one.